Let me tell you a little secret. Painting flowers will teach you how to paint anything. I mean, really. So today we're stepping away from flowers. I paint them every day, but I don't paint or doodle much else on a regular basis. So to prove my theory, you know, that flowers teach us all the things we need to know, I decided today to choose 10 items to sketch, things that felt uncomfortable to me that I wasn't super familiar with. Either subjects I hadn't sketched in a long time or ever. No practice, no mapping things out in a sketchbook first. I used the good paper first and just dove right in to see what my flower-loving hands and eyes could do. Let's look at the supplies for today. I'm using fluid watercolor paper. It's a cold press, 100% cotton. I'm gonna be reviewing this soon. Faber-Castell Pit Pen, it's a 0.7 millimeter tip. And I believe the number on the pen is 199 and it's got a big old M on the tip. So I'm gonna link all of this below because that was a really confusing explanation. I'm also using my Art for Joy Sake palette and an HB pencil. Now listen friends, you don't have the pit pen, use a fine point Sharpie, use a ballpoint pen, I don't care, use what you've got. First up friends, the avocado. I actually really love sketching avocados, papaya, anything like that. Now to give yourself a little grace and comfort, you can go in with a pencil first to kind of map out the basic shapes. An avocado is kind of like a weird shaped kidney bean, honestly. So here I am with my pencil, loose hand, light touch, and I'm just mapping things out very simply. I'm not spending a lot of time here at all. Think about that kidney bean shape with a skinnier area on one end. And then think about where you want to see a little bit of that avocado peel showing through, a little notch at the top and you're golden. Bring out that pen and let's get into it. You're going to go right over top. And the thing I like about this pit pen, it has a little bit of flexibility. If you press harder, you will get a little bit of a thicker line. And so, you know, what I love about my style of doodling, not that I'm like, I'm so awesome. No, I just really like to be a little more not precise, imprecise. Is that a word? I don't know. If you're purposely a little wiggly, a little quivery with your lines, your little imperfections aren't going to be as obvious and you're going to see more of that as I progress through these different items today. But imperfection reigns high here, friends. And then go ahead, you can erase immediately. You might see a little bit of a smudge here or there, like a little bit at the top of my avocado. I'm not too worried about it. See how my lines, they're not all continuous. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about in terms of imperfection reigning high. It's a good thing. The idea here is whimsy, expressive lines, and just splashy kind of expression here. And so I wet my avocado first, I'm going in with my cat's tongue brush. Ah, that's the supply I forgot to mention. I'm using my cat's tongue brush from my Art for Joy Sake brush collection. And then I'm going in with this gorgeous olive green and I'm just dabbing in the color, rinsing my brush, going in with the pit, using a little bit of fuchsia pink, a little bit of brown, use what you have and be happy about it. And then on the peel, I think that's what it's called, the skin, the peel, whatever, a mix of that olive green and brown, but I didn't necessarily mix it on the palette, it was just already on my brush, a little bit of more of an emerald green at the top edge there where the skin meets the flesh and we are done. Oh yeah, this is fast, loose, instinctive. This is kind of a get in, get it done, get out kind of approach. And what you're left with is a very instinctive feeling piece of art. The imperfections, it's cliche. I know, give this type of art its character. Moving on to a butterfly, friends. I'm going right in with the pen. Let's think about teardrop shapes. This is a side view butterfly. Think about a teardrop that's got the point on one end, but then really balloons out at the other end, very bulbous. And of course, kind of wiggle your pen as you make the marks, interrupt the lines to give this little doodle some super duper character. You're gonna go right underneath that first balloon-ish teardrop and create another one. And then a long skinny little body of 
the butterfly that kind of curves outwards. Then go ahead in and add the suggestion of the wings behind the main wings. And of course, we're gonna get into the watercolor now. Wet those wings, don't worry if your water is clean. I'm adding some purple. And without rinsing my brush, some bright pink and a little bit of blue. Notice my strokes are very specific. They are not sloppy, they're intentional, but they're quick. I'm mostly using the tip of my cat's tongue. You can see I'm even holding my brush almost perpendicular to the page. And while the page is still damp, adding a few strokes at the bottom there, that bottom most wing to add a little bit of texture and then a little bit of dirty peach. That's right, peach mixed with whatever's on my brush because I didn't rinse it for the body and a little touch of unexpected red on the antenna and we are done. Boom, love it. Okay, I lied, we're not done. I really enjoyed that red. Dabbing some of that red on the underside of that lower wing and a few dots for texture and interest. And okay, now we're done. Okay, nothing gives me heart palpitations as an artist who loves flowers like animals. Friends, you're always asking me to paint animals and I literally, I, I start to break out in sweats. So this one for me is the one that is the most challenging for sure. Let's get into it. Definitely going into this one with the pencil first. Give myself a little bit of grace and comfort because uh, yeah. Let's get this fox going friends. That's right, little fox. He's gonna be cute. I'm, I'm talking myself up. We're gonna create a side view where the fox is kind of looking over his shoulder slyly. Start with a really casual, graceful triangle that has a curve on the bottom. And then that tail is basically an oval with a point on the end that's coming out from the underside of that initial triangle. Let's head up to the top and another circle-ish oval that's got a point on the front and you can start to see. Now, you can adjust your angle here. I wanted his head pointing up to the sky a little bit more. And then let's get those ears in, basically interrupting the basic shapes that you just mapped out. A little dot for the nose. Oh, oh, I'm loving this. I'm feeling this, friends. And then the underside, his, the belly of his coat, that white part, I'm sketching that out. I'm just cutting in, again, interrupting those basic shapes. A little dot dash for the eye, and it's time to go in with the pen. That wasn't so scary. That wasn't so scary. Everything that I did here, I've learned and done a million times over in a flower illustration. And so it gave me the confidence to get in and get this done in a way that I could feel good about. I'm really excited about this little guy. Just a note here, friends, for how I hold my pen. I often hold my pen, my pencil, my brush, almost completely perpendicular to the page. Don't feel like you need to copy that if that feels uncomfortable for you. You need to find your comfort level, how holding your pen or your brush works for you. You can certainly try my way, but if it doesn't feel right, then it isn't right for you. All right, I'm going right in with the eraser. Don't be nervous about this. I am using a Stedler eraser that's got a little plastic shield to protect it from picking up the oils from your hands. I'm linking all of the supplies below, friends, so check it out. I love this eraser. Stedler has always been my go-to eraser. And I love the fact that I can go right in immediately and this pit pen is not smudging or smearing. It really feeds into kind of my crazy art making nature, my very impatient nature, and I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, loading up the cat's tongue with a really pretty peach. I already had this on my palette, but it's basically a mixture of a yellow and a pink, or you could do it with a little bit of red and a white and a skosh of yellow. And then of course, a bright red mixed with a little bit of brown and I'm really picking up that foxy coat vibe. I love it. I'm spreading it all around now with a clean, damp brush. The point here, friends, is not to perfectly fill in your fox. Now, if that's your vibe and you love an even fill and gradients from light to dark that are super smooth, do that. But I like a sketchier approach. 
I like my color separation to be really obvious and that's what I'm doing here. All right, this guy needs a few hearts. He's dreaming of love. He's cute and cuddly and I just feel the need to add in a few hearts because yeah. And then rinse that brush and add a little dab of pink, a little dab. If you try to fill, you're gonna overfill those hearts. So make sure your brush isn't too wet or too filled with pigment. And then you can always come back in with a clean, damp brush and lift out the excess. <gasps> I'm so happy with my fox. Okay, next up, you might think I'm cheating a little. I said no flowers today and I meant it. But now we're gonna do a house plant and I'm feeling the mojo, I'm feeling good. So I'm going right in with the pen right in. Here's a little tip when you're sketching things like vases or vessels. Symmetry. Whatever sketch line you create on one side, go right to the other side and repeat it. You might want to rewind what I did there, but think of symmetry. So if you've already created one line, your hand is kind of broken in and you feel good about that one line, Go right to the other side and mirror that line again. All right, friends, I added in the little hanging ropes of this house plant, and I'm just going in with a few curved lines here and there to give myself a sense of the structure. This is definitely more of like a vine-like plant. And then I am adding little ovals on either side of each curved line that is the base of my vines. And I'm just filling in, filling in. Some of my ovals are continuous and they look really perfect. Some of them are very loop-de-loo and some look more like circles. But variety is the spice of life here for sure. Pull your hand away every so often just to get a sense if all of your ovals feel very similar in shape. I would recommend just switching it up a bit, adding a few different shaped ovals, some circles, some dots just to keep things interesting. Now I'm going to decorate my hanging pot here with a triangle pattern. And again, imperfection is where the character comes. So don't feel like this has to be a perfectly balanced repeat. Just kind of get it in there, get the basics in, let it be imperfect on purpose. With imperfections, in your art with this kind of style, you gotta go all in because if your imperfections aren't imperfect enough, they're going to potentially look more like a mistake than an imperfection. Oh my gosh, let me repeat that. As I define some of the edges here on the pot, just adding some additional lines in for dramatic effect. But friends, if your imperfections are not intentional, looking enough, they're going to potentially appear like mistakes. So how can you make sure that your imperfections feel and look intentional? Repeat the same imperfection again and again in different areas of the sketch or doodle. That's my best advice. All right, heading in with a little bit of dampness, that olive green, and then I'm dropping and dabbing in some of a brighter green, use what you have. Look at that, look at that. By not attempting to bully the paint that I've laid on the paper and letting it just do its own thing in the water, in the dampness, you're getting natural shadows and highlights. You don't have to struggle in this particular style of sketching to get those highlights and to overwork the area. Just let the pigment and the water do its thing. Leave some areas white. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. Anybody else loving that peach pot? I love her. I'm adding a little bit of the peach up into the greenery, a few dots and swirls and dabs. Oh yeah, I'm loving her. I'm loving her. I, I feel like I could just doodle watercolor sketch these hanging house plants like for hours. Okay, friends, let's head into comments. Do you have an item, a subject matter that freaks you out, that you avoid at all costs, like me and my animals? Let me know. Let's chat about it. What are your fear items, your fear subject matter? And I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, maybe it's a little presumptuous, but I know I'm having a blast. I'm still reeling from the success of my cute little fox. So if you're having a good time like I am, would you give this video a boop? 
that's a like, and it really helps others that are out there just like you wondering what in the world to do with watercolor. It helps them find the channel. I don't know, friends. It's a weird algorithm thing here on the YouTubes, but yeah, the boop, it helps. Next up, we've got a little toadstool action. Friends, a little bit of advice. I've got some of it peppered throughout this video, so stick around because you never know when I'm going to come off with a good one. But for this type of project, work small. Do yourself a favor, work small. These little pieces of paper are four by six and I'm not even using half of them. Work small, give yourself some grace. All right, going right in with my pen, I'm creating a very kind of a loosey goosey, lazy bell shape. And then coming right underneath and creating the stem of that mushroom. And again, you could think about it like a teardrop, a squared off teardrop on that bottom edge and then add in your circles. I'm gonna basically have one full circle and the rest are gonna be a partial. I feel like that gives things just a sense of depth and a little bit of dimension. And then a few smiley face accents on the stem, but don't make them continuous. That's my suggestion. It feels a little bit more natural if they don't go all the way across the stem. All right, another very crazy loosey-goosey uh, bell-shaped moment here, and then go right underneath with a few lines that are going to suggest the underside of the mushroom. You know what I'm talking about. I'm sure someone's gonna head into comments and let me know what that part of it is actually called. Friends, let's slow this down. Let's take another look at this because this is a little trickier. All right, the cap of this mushroom's heading up towards the sky a little bit. That's why you see the underbelly go underneath. Think about where your stem is going to be at the center and start creating these curved lines emanating from that center. So basically you're mirroring these lines from one central point going up towards the underside of the mushroom cap. And then again, your stem is really just a long kind of rectangle that has curved edges. And those curves are totally up to you and exactly where you want them to curve and bulb out and be thicker and thinner. It's really hard to create a toadstool that doesn't look like a toadstool because there's so many variations in nature on this one. And my little dots, friends, I am making them more oblong on this one. And I've got definitely more that are in full view versus a partial view. I love that. Friends, if you're curious about these directional lines and how you create dimension when you're sketching, I have a few illustrating videos. Now they're flowers, cause you know me and my flowers, but I'm gonna link them below. Cause I think they're gonna be really helpful when you're trying to create shape and volume with your illustrations. All right, got a clean cat's tongue here, adding some water. I'm not filling in these shapes perfectly with water. And then I'm gonna come right over with a nice tan that's got a little bit of a green undertone and just a few strokes, a few strokes on purpose, leaving some of that white. And then just dab in a few moments of red, rinse your brush, and then dab in a few moments of pink and then rinse your brush. And so friends, I think you can probably see where I'm going here, a few dabs of yellow and then blendy blend with a almost dry brush. It's gonna be slightly damp. You don't wanna add a lot of water at this point because if you did, things would just be completely out of control. I'm even lifting out some of the pigment because it's just too much. And now with the tip of my cat's tongue, I am blending and blending. I'm not over blending because I kind of like that sketchy separation of color. If you want a nice smooth transition from color to color, you just want to have a little less moisture on your brush and you want to rinse your brush more often. Now I'm going into the other toadstool with a pink, a few dabs around, and then a few dabs of yellow. And that is a fluorescent yellow, but friends, don't worry, it won't stay fluorescent when things start to mix and mingle on the page. And then that damp brush and just blendy blend all around. Don't overblend if you want to see that distinct color separation between pink and yellow. Oh my gosh, I love this technique, it's so fun. 
It's so fun, so meditative and cathartic. If you're loving these toadstools, I have a really killer video. It's a choose your own adventure. Yeah, love the 80s reference. You're welcome. And you get to choose how to finish one painting of toadstools three different ways. Adding just a little bit of blue undertone to the underside of that mushroom cap and we are done. All right, next up, I'm going to sketch a framed piece of art. I love this one. Now you might get nervous because you're like, oh my gosh, a picture frame is a rectangle and how am I gonna create a perfect rectangle? Guess what? You're not. You're on purpose going to make this rectangle very imperfect. Let me show you. All right, by design, the edges of your frame are not going to be straight. They're going to be wavy. Very simple. That way, any imperfections, any skewed perspective is going to be so much less noticeable. And then the interior of your frame, those are going to be straight, but guess what? They're not going to be continuous lines because sketching a continuous line that is perfectly straight is a lot harder than a few dotted lines next to one another. And then you can go in with a final round of lines that are continuous but their imperfections won't matter as much because you've got a really nice, strong structure down initially. I'm going over and over again, those lines to just create a little bit of depth and dimension. And then along the edges of this wonky wobbly silhouette of my frame, I'm adding a few dashes and dots. I'm thinking kind of like a Baroque frame. So I think you might see where I'm going with this one. And then a little horizon line, a little bump, a little hill, a little mountain, and who knows, a little shrubbery. Yeah, yep, this is definitely gonna be a little landscape in my painting here. And of course we need a little sunshine with a half circle. Well, it's kind of like a third circle, but you get it. A few birds, Vs, dots, dashes, and there's your birds. All right, let's get into this with some watercolor. I'm using a peach initially, just a few strokes around, a little bit of a tan, and there's that peach again. A little bit of brown, that's a little strong, but don't worry, we can blendy blend it out. A few dabs, dots, and dashes, going over top with a little bit more of the peach or the tan. If you don't have a pre-mixed tan on your palette, just take a brown. If you have a little bit of white watercolor, mix that together, you'll be fine. A little bit of red that was just sitting on my mixing tray and then I'm gonna blendy blend that out with a clean damp brush I don't actually have a gold on this palette I don't have anything that resembles kind of a perfect Baroque gold so I am winging it adding a little bit of that fluorescent yellow but you know what friends it works it works you could totally though use a gold pen on this and it would be divine all right rinse your brush and a little bit of green Really, really quick and simple, very light-handed here, friends. Not a lot of color going on. Simple yellow in the sunshine, a little bit of purple and blue in my mountains to give that atmospheric perspective. And you know what? I said it, I gotta call it out. If you're curious about painting landscapes in a little bit more of a serious way than this, I'm gonna link a video below. Don't wanna miss it. And of course, we have to have a blue sky I love this illustration idea, this little doodle, because you could put any kind of artwork in this. You could do a series of these. Imagine a series of these where the artwork inside the frame was like watercolor patterns, like stripes and circles and dots and dashes. Oh my gosh, you could have so much fun with this. Heading back into that frame, and yes, it's still wet, but it's okay. My pit pen, it just powers through. Adding a few more dots and dashes, a little dot swirl on each corner for definition to kind of push that slightly Baroque vibe a little bit more. I'm trying to stay somewhat symmetrical. If I make a, a series of dots and dashes on the left side, I'm gonna go over and kind of repeat that on the right side, but I'm not being terribly precious about it. And there she is, so fun. Oh my gosh. Friends, if you're having a good time, please give this video a boop. That's a like, yeah. It's like a doodle party in here. I'm, 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 all, I'm all for it. All right, next up, and these were super popular about five years ago, but they're still super fun to draw. And in my last book, I even included a whole project about how to illustrate crystals and rocks and agate and all sorts of fun stuff. So you're basically gonna start with a rectangle 
and add some dimension to it. All right, so you want to go back to kind of your grade school, how to draw a cube mentality and put a little point on top of that cube and just go with it. Listen, friends, with these crystal doodles, if the perspective is wonky, it doesn't matter. They still end up looking like crystals. <laughs> I kid you not. Watch this. I got my perspective a little wonked at the top here, but you know what? She's still gonna look like a crystal when it's all said and done. You definitely wanna mind your imperfections here. Don't feel like you have to create continuous lines all the time on the longer edges of your crystals. You can interrupt those lines. And then I'm gonna just add a few strokes in areas to signify kind of those facets and how the light is hitting things a little differently. But a simple line will do here and there. All right, and then I'm gonna shoot out from the right-hand side with a skinny little weird crystal that really tapers at the bottom. And look at that, just add in a few rectangles and squares within that initial shape and you've got yourself a fairly convincing crystal. Continuing on the right side here with a more blocky kind of rock-like shape crystal. And then I'm going over to the left-hand side and creating another one. Now friends, let me tell you what, if you can sketch crystals, you can sketch rocks and that's gonna help out your landscapes. It's like the circle of life. It's the circle of creative life. Mm-hmm, yep. Don't worry, I won't break out into song. Oh gosh, I want to though. The circle of life. Um, I, I couldn't help myself. Oh Lord. Okay, let's get some color on this thing before I completely lose all my subscribers. Some pink from a clean brush on a dry page, a little bit of red. I'm just scratching in those colors, friends, and then I'm going in with a clean, damp brush and doing a little blendy blend. Mm -hmm. And just carrying out that color because that color is pretty strong on that center crystal. So just kind of pull some of the color out with the clean brush into the other areas. Now, of course, got to add some purple. Got to get some other colors in here. So I'll stroke a purple, little purple here and there and everywhere. And then maybe a little blue. Yeah, whoo, that's dark. That's dark. Can always add a little water over top. Damp brush, blot your brush and pull up some of that blue. Friends, if you're curious about the basics of watercolor and you just haven't given yourself the time to dive into it yet, I have a mastermind video, I'm gonna link it below, all about the basics. Okay, I don't know if y'all know, but I have another business. It's a wedding invitation business and the mason jar is a little bit of a joke in the wedding world. Cause like forever people decorated with mason jars and all the wedding people were just tired of it. But you know what? I love me a good mason jar. And when you can sketch or doodle a mason jar, you can just do so many things. You can sketch flowers inside of them or rocks or marbles. And so we're gonna do a mason jar. And the symmetry thing, make one mark on one side and mirror that same mark on the other side is so important with a vessel of any kind. So notice what I'm doing. Let's repeat that and slow it down. I make a little mark at the top to signify the left side of my jar lid. And then I'm immediately estimating the distance that I need and making the other mark on the right hand side to be the right hand bounding point of my jar lid. And then I'm repeating this symmetry doodling with the long edge of the jar. Left hand side long line, right hand side long line. And then I'm going underneath with a pretty deep smiley face that's interrupted. It's not a continuous line. And then I'm repeating it with kind of the same smiley face in the other direction. So that gives you the perspective of the jar, the base that you can see through the glass. And then let's go back up to the lid. Same kind of idea. These are all mirrored lines. So one line is a smiley face. The other line on top is a mountain. Smiley face, mountain. I hope that makes sense. I think that makes sense. A few little short lines going vertically on the lid for some detail and let's get the ball jar in there. Just a little very imperfect sketch. Don't be precious about this. If you want to start with pencil to kind of map it out though and give yourself that grace and comfort, go ahead. And a few little wire loops on the side and we're going to create a little 
handle. And friends, this handle is so imperfect, but it's okay. Add a few little lines to suggest dimension on that handle and a few little lines to suggest facets and reflection on the jar itself. And you can go in and intensify any lines that you would like for depth and dimension. And we're about done here. We're about done here. And you knew, you knew it was gonna happen. There's gonna be a blue, there's gonna be a blue jar. So the blue watercolor's coming. Ah, I love me the blue mason jars. Oh my gosh, so good. All right, rinse that brush really well and add a stroke of blue on the left-hand side or wherever, and then blend it out with a clean, damp brush. A little bit more blue on the bottom. This is a light-handed stroke of blue, so not a lot of pigment on your brush for this one, friends. And blendy blend it out. You could do a little bit of gray for your lid. I don't actually have a gray, so I mixed together all the colors and it gave me something that kind of looked like a gray. There she is. Okay, you ask me all the time to do lessons on seascapes and I continue to ignore you, but maybe this seashell will make you feel better about me ignoring you. Um, I can't ignore you forever. But anyway, a seashell. Oh, I love the beach. I go every year. I love it. Okay, you know those swirly dirly shells? Swirly dirly, yeah, I made up. I, I made that up. All right, this is basically the same shape, really big on the bottom, and then descending in size, connected until you get to the very top, which is super duper tiny. Friends, let's repeat this. Let's slow it down and see how we made it. Now, you know I love to give you a basic shape reference. The teardrop doesn't work here. The kidney bean yeah, doesn't work here. But you know what does work here? A parallelogram. Yeah, yeah. My geometry teacher from 10th grade would be really proud of me. So I want you to think about a parallelogram that has rounded edges. Now it's gonna be an imperfect parallelogram. Go ahead, try to say that three times fast. All right, friends, so rounded, big parallelogram on the bottom. That's your biggest one. And then connect another one on top. It's gonna be a little bit narrower and a little bit shorter. And then another one connected on top of that, even narrower and even a little bit shorter. You get the drill. That's it. Now you can head in and add a few dashes and dots to suggest a little bit of detail, but then it's time for paint. And friends, fill this shell like you want to. There's so many ways, peaches, browns, skosh of yellow, even a little bit of blue or a purple. This could be an iridescent shell. You could bring in some interference inks. And then a little bit of darker brown is where I'm going for kind of that almost like tiger fur appearance. I don't know what that type of shell is called, but you know where it almost looks like it has animal spots. That's kind of where I went with this one. I love that shell. All right, friends, next up, very last, but certainly not least, we all need to know how to sketch a watercolor palette. Let's do it. Heading right in, friends. This is going to be kind of your classic professional half pan style palette. I'm gonna have the base rectangle. Remember, imperfection, friends. And then you're gonna have the lid rectangle, all right? The lid rectangle is gonna be a very shallow parallelogram in a lot of ways. Now notice, I'm being very specific not to make the edges, the silhouette, straight lines. I'm gonna come down from that base rectangle and create the sense that it's a tray. Just follow those lines that you made. Think back to your grade school, how to draw a cube, and you'll be good. All right, the half pans. Here again, I'm using the symmetry sketching method. Create the same line over and over again. So I started with the top edge of the half pan and then I went to the left edge of the half pan and now the bottom edge. And just notice this way of sketching symmetry and repetitive marks helps keep everything in line versus if you tried to sketch each of these half pans separately, you would struggle more with spacing and making sure everything lined up and everything fit well. And then I'm going in with that final right-hand side of the half pan 
and I'm using a little bit of a darker line to create a little bit of depth. Some more depth lines adding in a little bit of structure now that I have my basic shapes in. I'm going in with a more continuous line on all these edges and taking a moment to adjust my perspective there on the right hand side. And then a few vertical marks down the front of the palette tray. Yep. Don't worry about those imperfections. Something to keep in mind with these type of doodles. You can always cover up any imperfections that look like imperfections or mistakes with a bit of watercolor. All right, and then the mixing tray inside the lid. I'm using that symmetrical sketching method again. Create the same line over and over on either side. So these are three little rectangles and there you have it. All right, just time to add the color into that palette. Now with this one, friends, you just wanna make sure you rinse your brush in between each color or your half pans are gonna get muddy and you don't need much color or water on your brush at all or you could really have a mess on your hands going outside the lines and all the things. I mean, I'm all for going outside the lines, but in this one, I kinda of wanna keep it like, you know, mm-hmm. All right, just go through, add the colors you love, build your perfect palette. I'm going in to add some shadow to the actual box of my palette and I'm creating kind of that classic black, you know, it's not the art for joy sake palettes. <laughs> it's time to add some interest to the mixing palette, just a little bit of light color here and there, just so it looks like your palette doodle has some actual paint in the tray. A really soft blue, maybe mixed with a little bit of brown to add some shadows to the half pan tray. And friends, I'm calling it done. All right, here's some key takeaways. And friends, don't head out yet because this is big. This is huge, listen up. Don't ever let anyone, including yourself, shame you for loving flowers most. Flowers have so much to teach us. The curve of that lily petal becomes the curve of the fox's neck. The interest in details inside the middle of the peony become texture on a seashell. What you learned painting that hellebore flower become the little doodles inside of your hanging basket sketch. All of your hard work on flowers or landscapes or whatever it is that you love to paint more than anything, all of that hard work teaches you what you need to know about painting, sketching, making art out of anything. Now, if you wanna ease yourself into some sketching, I want you to check out this video where I create poppies with watercolor markers. And friends, I wish you happy, happy painting.